So we are live, and this is without a doubt the, the most proudest moment of my YouTube career to date because we've got Stuart Spinks from the Norfolk Honey Company here today with us to have a chat. So Stuart, thank you so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed our little 15 minute preamble. I don't, I'm not going to say for, for anyone who doesn't know who you are because everyone will know who you are, but would you just like to introduce yourself to everyone on the stream here and, uh, and say hello? Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Stuart from the Norfolk Honey Company. Um, we run a commercial bee farming outfit here in Norfolk and, um, uh, we try to produce videos to help other beekeepers. So, um, yeah. Excellent. So th thanks for the intro. My, I started beekeeping about 10 years ago in Birmingham. I had a swarm land and I remember that the weekend that I had the swarm land, I was so excited as you, as you would be the first ever swarm that you get and it's sitting in your garden. And I remember just watching binge watching the YouTube videos, your YouTube videos. And there wasn't much, there wasn't much choice at that point. It was a case of you, you type beekeeping into YouTube and it was all of your videos and they were so good. So you truly inspired me to become a beekeeper and also inspired me to do my own YouTube channel. So th thank you for that. Oh, great. Yeah, that's nice. yeah, nice to be here this evening with you, Lawrence. Thanks, Stuart. So we are for the first time tonight, we are streaming across three different platforms. So you might see the alerts pop up on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. So we'll see how that goes. You can ask questions in the chat and we've got seven questions to start us off. So we'll jump straight into it. Uh, just, yeah, we'll go for it and I'll ask uh, some questions. So first question, I've not got the names down here, but is due to the late spring cold snap, will you be feeding pollen sub or patties? Um, yeah, so we've uh, we've already been feeding. Um, we actually harvest pollen from our colonies and feed it back to the bees uh, generally at this time of the year uh, here in Norfolk. And, and I think the one thing to say is that uh, wherever you are uh, watching this from, your local conditions really do dictate um, what you need to do and when you need to do it. So what I'm doing here in Norfolk can be completely different to other parts of the UK, let alone around the world. So you have to take into account your local situation before you plow ahead with with doing anything. But we, yeah, so we we mix our own pollen uh, with fondant. So we just mix it into baker's fondant, and uh, we feed that. Um, we try to feed it as early as we can without being um excessively early so maybe late february we start to get a little bit of pollen into some of the colonies and again i, I think the the best thing about beekeeping is there are so many options so um, you don't have to feed pollen you don't have to do anything in beekeeping it, it, whatever you want to do with your beekeeping is is perfectly fine there are of course a few simple rules to follow to help beekeeping be successful for you but generally you know whatever you want to do is perfectly fine so we try to build up our colonies for uh, the oilseed rape crop so we have an awful lot of oilseed rape in Norfolk and we keep our bees on farms uh, predominantly close to home over the winter but they are on farms that have oilseed rape so we're trying to maximize a crop of oilseed rape um, nectar that comes in and we use that to build up colonies and also to take a honey crop um, at the moment uh, we we're into some crazy warm weather and the locally we've got something called goat willow that is in flower it's it's just starting to flower uh, big puffy flowers full of pollen and the bees absolutely love it and as soon as it warms up they're all over it uh, and they'll just ignore, certainly pollen substitute, they will completely ignore in favour of a natural pollen. And so as long as we've got access to goat willow and then subsequently those other flowering sp spring plants, there's probably not any need for us to continue feeding with our pollen. Having said that, if we were to be hit badly by a cold snap into April, then we would look to switch back to feeding some pollen substitute or as we're doing pollen. And the reason for that is once you get a large 
um, brood nest area and the bees are developing that brood nest into a, a really large patch of brood, the last thing you want is for them to run out of um, their reserves. So running out of either honey stores, be it fondant if you fed them fondant, or pollen and pollen substitute. So once you start feeding them, you do need to keep an eye on them. But I have a feeling, touch wood, we might well be through the very worst of it, and we shouldn't need to be feeding them any um, pollen, pollen substitute or patties uh, from this point on. Fingers crossed. It's it's an interesting topic. I, I've recently just done a video saying why why I'm so glad that I've not fed any pollen sub this year because about a week ago we had like 13, 14 inches of snow and it was like yeah. a real genuine like week long cold snap. It's been so cold up here that bees have just not been flying. So I think for me, I was happy that I didn't feed any pollen sub because we've got nothing to build them up to. Right. It's just there's no there's no all seed rape or anything. And if I'd have built them up, I would have had real issues with them just being locked away. But I think now at this point, if the weather turned now and it was continually like rainy and drizzly, but warm, then I think I'd probably go and, and add some then just to keep them ticking. Yeah, over. it's really important that people look at their local conditions. Um, it's all well and good for me to say we're not going to feed or we are going to feed, be it fondant pollen sub whatever we're we're giving them um, but for your own individual local area it's so important just to see what's happening and to put that into context with your bees so think about especially for the the kind of the beginner beekeepers that are out there think about what your bees are doing at this time of the year and if you've not got the experience then grab a book or talk to a more experienced beekeeper and think about the size of the colony that you've got and the progress that they're going to make and put that into context of your local weather conditions and whether you need to feed them or not. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. All right, next question then. So it says, what, what months do you typically harvest honey and do you harvest multiple times throughout the year? Yeah, so, um, do you know, I actually had to look at our google photos to just check the time of year that we we do actually harvest um because my memory is just rubbish so we we have to write everything down that's important to us and that mostly goes on the, the um hive roofs um however uh, last year as an example uh, we harvested in the third week of may and that was the oilseed rape crop uh, and the spring crop and, and interestingly last year for the first time in a long time, uh, we produced a fantastic hawthorn honey. And it was a really special honey, not masses, you know, just uh, maybe 100 kilos or so. But it was absolutely gorgeous and um, well worth um, separating out from the oilseed rape honey. Uh, and you know that it's completely different. You can see that it's different. So it's worth separating. So we did that in May. Uh, and that tends to be uh, our regular spring harvest and then again we up until uh, this year we've always finished um, our honey production by the end of July so uh, by the first week of August normally we're taking off uh, all of the honey and extracting um, this year we do have an opportunity to go possibly to some heather so we we might well give that a try never happened before so you know it'll be completely new to me so after all these years of beekeeping uh, we're going to experience something completely new which is you know one of the things i love about beekeeping so yeah um middle of may and then first or second week of august is uh, when we uh, when we harvest our honey i cannot wait to see your adventure to the heather that my it's my probably my favorite thing in beekeeping is opening up a hive at the heather and the okay. smell is just the most overpowering yeah, yeah. in the world. It really is the very best. So I will uh, look forward to that with great yeah, interest. Absolutely. So I, I've just, that was the perfect segue into my next question as well, which is what is your favourite part about keeping bees? I've told you mine. Uh, yeah, so favourite part about keeping bees. I, you know, it's possibly a bit of a cliche, um, but it is helping other beekeepers. I absolutely love being able to 
uh, help somebody who's maybe new to beekeeping or has a particular problem with their beekeeping, maybe it's pests and diseases or they're looking to uh, solve why they can't produce any honey, uh, they want to put in a new queen and they don't know how to. I just get a big kick out of seeing um, people get the maximum amount of enjoyment out of their beekeeping. Um, I guess if I were forced to park that and think about beekeeping generally for me, uh, I would take it back actually to um, my very first few years of beekeeping. We lived in a, uh, a mid-terraced house here in Norwich and we had a very small garden and it had a, a kind of potting shed at the end of the garden. Uh, two or three windows facing out towards the house and that was where I made up all of my frames and put the wax in and cleaned all the propolis off and in the spring I'd go into the shed open up a new pack of foundation uh, we'd scrape down some boxes and just that smell of beekeeping in the spring is probably the best thing ever it's just a wonderful thing to have if you've got your beekeeping equipment in a shed and you've sat out all winter waiting for the new season to start that kind of rush of the new season um i, I having never done a parachute jump i people laugh at me because i liken it to a parachute jump we spend all winter kind of drifting down gently to the ground and then in the last few weeks you get that ground rush situation where the season's upon you and you've really got to get everything together all of a sudden and we seem to fail every year so i think my favorite part about beekeeping is coming into the spring from the winter and just the joy of everything around spring there's definitely a meme in there somewhere in terms of you hitting the ground in that parachute and then just being a massive tangled mess because that's uh, how yeah. I feel. in a bee suit no doubt yeah, suit, yeah. Yeah. um the, the first thing that you said about uh teaching and helping other people like that comes across so much in your videos in that thank you so much time to, to to give to people and it's not a well here's the answer you go in and you layer it and give all of the detail and so generous with the information so yeah you really can see that okay so next question uh, what, what are your plans for the beekeeping season yeah so lots of plans um we started planning uh last autumn and uh what we were planning to do uh, was to increase our colony numbers and unfortunately uh, we experienced uh, possibly the worst wasp um, population attack that we've ever had in one of our apiaries so we if uh, and people have watched the the videos um, we have the fishing lakes apiaries that that we've got and they're old gravel pits and it would appear that the ground being sandy and gravelly is perfect for wasp nests and so we split a lot of colonies last autumn to make up overwintering nukes and we lost a huge number of them so uh, we've had to uh, replan our spring and what we're actually going to do is to split colonies this spring which will obviously reduce the amount of uh, honey crop that we get in the spring. But we're committed to um, pollinating some borage in the summer. So we need to increase our numbers to be able to pollinate the borage, but also, of course, have strong enough colonies to take a crop off that. So we've got spring splits. And the way that we're going to do those is um, if uh, anyone's seen our Patreon videos, uh, we use the double brood split system uh, uh, we've used the demery split system a vertical split lots of different names for them uh, but that worked really well for us last spring so we're going to do that again so double up with brood boxes and then once we've got brood all the way through those double brood we can then split them one box will have a queen one will be queenless and then we'll introduce a queen in very simplistic terms we'll introduce a queen into the queenless um, brood box. Uh, we're pollinating oilseed rape this spring, so we'll have the bees on oilseed rape. Uh, we're going to the borage, uh, as I mentioned. Somewhere in between the oilseed rape and the borage, 
there will be some field beans. So we, we're lucky enough to have some field beans. Doesn't always produce a great deal of um, nectar. The conditions have to be right, but when it does, um, it, it kind of floods in fairly quickly. And then, of course, there's the possibility of the heather crop that we may be able to um, take. Still negotiating that, and I'm kind of excited, uh, anxious about the whole situation because we don't really have a great deal of heather here in Norfolk. So we're going to have to take the bees on a fairly lengthy journey, um, which we, you know, we do when we take the bees to the borage. But uh, you know, it will be a different type of journey for us. Um, and I guess. You know, our subscription Patreon page uh, is a major part of what we do uh, through the year uh, and through the active season. We'll produce usually three videos a week. We've got the weekly podcast that I produce as well. Uh, everything is done by myself and Steph, who helps me part time. And it takes an awful lot of work. Uh, the, uh, and I'm sure, Lawrence, you <laughs> you know only too well the video that goes out is a very shortened version of all the takes and retakes that we try to do in order to maybe get our language right so that we're explaining things properly. It, it's really difficult, particularly for us blokes, to kind of multitask and to try to think about what we're saying on the one hand, try not to swear when we've been stung on the other hand, and put across exactly what we're trying to do. So um, we do all of that, all of the admin behind that, uh, and we'll we'll be doing that this year as well. And um, it's been a couple of years since we've regularly posted on YouTube for various reasons, um, which I won't bore everyone with, but we're hoping this year to get back onto YouTube once a week to be able to share some of our, our journey with everybody as well. Um, so that's you know that's going to be quite busy four videos a week plus the podcast which which goes out we've just i've literally just posted and published to patreon our i think it's 250th podcast so we've been doing it for five years and i think in that time i've probably only missed a, a dozen weeks so you know i'm quite proud of that because you know there's a, there's a lot of work that goes into that and then finally our local association, the Norwich and District Beekeepers Association, uh, has a teaching apiary, and we've just secured, I've just helped secure um, a fabulous paddock where we can move our teaching apiary to, and uh, it's just going to be such a wonderful environment to be able to teach beginner beekeepers, and, and I'm involved with that teaching process as well. We're, we're running some uh, beginner sessions and we'll be inspecting on a weekly basis so there's a lot involved in there fingers crossed i did notice um uh, matt posted a question about the ranger i just saw it fly through the the ford ranger has had a checkered past we've had lots of issues with it but at the moment touchwood it's doing just fine thanks matt um i'm hoping that it will continue for another year or two uh, and then we're going to have to think about maybe replacing it. But yeah, uh, it's it's going to be an interesting drive up to the heather with uh, with the ranger. <laughs> it yeah, sounds and, like, and, and and that'll be us through to Christmas again, Lawrence. That'll be the year done. Yeah. What an amazing set of plans! Uh, do you, have you been to the borage before? I think this is our fourth year. It's really interesting. Funny story. Um, I've never been able to get my bees onto borage. Years and years and years, I've been trying trying to find somebody that will allow me to take my bees to the borage. And then uh, a few seasons ago, our, our first trip down, I think it was, uh, this will be probably our fourth year, third year. Somebody out there will know more than, more than me, to be honest. Um, but I had a phone call from a guy who'd been onto the website and... Um, gave me a call to ask if I'd got enough colonies to pollinate his borage. And literally the next week had another phone call from another farmer who wanted me to pollinate his borage. So it's just, you know, really crazy how things happen. And it's a bit like trying to find a new apiary. I'm sure lots and lots of people out there who are going, how do I find a new apiary? How do I actually get my bees out of the back garden? Cause they keep 
chasing me down the garden path and into an oat apiary. And when you first start, it seems almost impossible. And it's, you know, some people like myself don't want to go banging on farmers' doors and asking if we can put our bees on their land. Uh, but as soon as you get one, you'll find that more and more will will pop up. So um, persevere with it and, and just ask around. Um, get your name out there and you, you'll soon find people will have land for you to put your bees on. There's there's nothing better than getting your bees in and out April there, isn't there? Yeah, I, absolutely. I remember my, I have 36 colonies in my back garden and that was that was 36 to too many, I think. And then the relief from getting them out yeah. of there and just getting them into somewhere else that was nice and isolated and it was just a lovely place to go and be excuse the terrible pun but just to just to be there in in the forest doing nothing other than just checking your bees it was great and and my wife was really happy about it as well oh there's nothing better than when we have wonderful hobby business you know you're out in the sunshine sometimes the pouring rain but you're with your bees you know that's your office in the fields of of this wonderful country that we have I can't think of anything better. And although my wife is in the room next door, I have to say, uh, since taking on beekeeping full time as a, as a career option, I don't really think I've worked a day in my life since that point. It just it's just such a joy to be out with the bees. Uh, I love every minute of it. Yeah, we're definitely very privileged. Uh, just on the borage, the, the final thing. I, lo I love borage honey. So some it's, it's a bit like oil seed rate for some people. Some people really don't like it, but bor uh, borage honey is, I think, my favourite honey. That okay. we, we never take our bees to the borage because we we only grow sheep in Wales, so you don't get right. any of that good, fun arable crop. Um, but we we get we get we buy in borage honey to sell, and it is it is my favourite. I love the taste and I love the texture of it as well. It's great. Yeah, and uh, you know it, it comes across in so many different shades some some is almost as clear as water and then some is really quite dark and it's it's really interesting the the different um shades uh, the different colors of of the honey from from the borage that we have interestingly for those of you that um haven't uh, a microscope uh, you can always check to see where your bees have been by looking at the pollen that's in your honey and um, it's a very very simple process once you've got the basic tools and they don't cost a huge amount it's such good fun and it's one of my favorite pastimes when i have the the time to be able to do it is to just get some honey um centrifuge out the pollen and have a look at the different pollens that are in that honey and of course it allows you to say to people this is honey. This is hawthorn honey. You know, this is blackberry honey. It's just a, it's a great part of beekeeping that I thoroughly enjoy. Oh, I can imagine. I think uh, people think I'm obsessed with Black Bee Honey Company, but they, uh, they sell borage honey, but they don't sell it under the name borage honey. They sell it under the name Starflower Honey. Mm. I love a good bit of marketing, and I just think when you see yeah. it on the label, Starflower Honey. Oh, well, that's going to be a bestseller. That one. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, right, next question for you then is, what is your favourite style of beehive? Um, my favourite style of beehive in terms of uh, the type of hive that we use, I guess. So, so I guess, yeah, you can interpret that, whether it's poly or wood, or you've got a, a, a special nice looking one or a long hive. Just uh, give us Okay, thoughts. so uh, this year we've switched entirely to Langstroth hives right. and... Um, it just makes sense with the number of colonies that we have now. Uh, having gone through so many different hive types and styles in order, really, in order to produce the videos, I, I think it's really important that uh, you talk about something that you've experienced. And um, at one point, I'd never used a Langstroth hive, so I couldn't really talk to people about the pros and cons of a Langstroth. So we've kind of had lots of different uh, hives over, over the period. So we settled on the Langstroth hive. Um, excuse me. Uh, my reason for that is because we seem, I guess, generally to favour more and more large brood nest areas, larger colonies in the brood box. And the Langstroth just seems to hold... The, the number of bees really well. 
And it's very rare that I find a single Langstroth brood box is not big enough to take the entire brood nest area of the bees that we have. So it, it's nice to run colonies on a single brood when they're on um, uh, production. Uh, obviously, we, we stack them in double brood in order to do, do the splits, but we push them back down into single brood uh, ready for honey production. So that's really important because if they run out of space in their, their brood box, then it's likely that you could be pushing them down that nasty swarming route. So you don't, you know, you don't want to be doing that. Uh, the way that I've always inspected, um, so we have our our frames traditionally, whether it's been national, commercial, Smith, WBC, whatever it is, I've always had the frames in a cold way. And uh, so for those of those of you out there that are unfamiliar with the warm and the cold way, uh, if you imagine you're standing directly in front of the hive, the warm way is with the frames across going front to back. And the cold way, if you stood to one side of the hive, you then have the frames going front to back, side to side, if that makes sense. Not a very good explanation. Um, so uh, what I discovered was that having the uh, frames in the cold way allowed me to get more people around the back of the hive in order to do an inspection and demonstrate what I was doing. If you have it in the warm way, they tend to kind of come in at the sides. So you've got um, people stood on either side, whereas if you're, you're demonstrating with the cold way, you've got most of the people, I'm trying to show, you've got most of the people in front of you or to one side. So you can kind of make eye contact with people and make sure that they're understanding what you're doing. And the Langstroth is naturally set up in that way, the cold way. So it suits my beekeeping perfectly well. Uh, and then, of course, you've got uh, the boxes that go on top, the Langstroth um, supers or the medium boxes that we use um, are fantastic for, for storing honey. Uh, the bees love them. We, we go with nine frames and, uh, you know, they pull them out really well. Interestingly, uh, and again, you'll, you know, this is beekeeping. So we all have a choice to, to do things differently. Uh, we've always gone with nine frames in the brood box. Uh, sorry, in the suits. And uh, only on maybe one or two occasions have the bees decided that they're not going to draw out the foundation nice and square. They're going to go off at some odd angle. Uh, yet you have people that start with 11, then go to 10, and then go to 9, and, and maybe um, even less than that. Um, but we've always gone with 9, and that just works really, really well. And, of course, extracting them becomes a bit easier than if you've got 11 uh, in the box. So we're, we're on uh, honey pour Langstroths. They're poly hives, and I think they're absolutely fantastic. Our bees come through the winter really well on them. Uh, and I would certainly recommend them. And just last year, we switched to something called a techno set, which I think is similar to the one that you demonstrated recently, Lawrence, which yeah, had a bit of an odd name. I, know. I, didn't, I can't quite get my head around the, na the name that you were using. However, um, techno set sounds a lot safer to me, um, but it looked almost identical, to be honest. Uh, and they're really good as well. So they're a, a double walled plastic hive nasty word plastic but you know they they last really well and they have um polystyrene insulation in between that twin wall and it's a really well you've obviously got that set up now the system works really well um and, and fits together um very nicely so it's um it's been a a, a really interesting new format for uh, us to handle certainly over the the last year just while we're talking hives, um, the most fun I've ever had with a beehive is a top bar hive. If you've never tried a top bar hive, go out and build yourself a top bar hive. I have um, Pete to thank, um, who helps us occasionally. Uh, he, uh, he basically built it for me because my woodworking skills are rubbish uh, and it just wouldn't, wouldn't have gone together properly. And a top bar hive is just such fun. You're never going to get a great deal of honey from it. 
uh, we we didn't take any uh, over the last couple of years. Um, but just to see the bees drawing out their comb from a top bar in that kind of triangular Toblerone shape, it's it's just lovely. It really is lovely. Um, so, yeah, it, it's um, top bar hive. Give it a try. Uh, any kind of top bar setup. Um, yeah, it was, was really good fun. It's, it's on my list, so I'm going to try and do that this year. And I, oh, I, I do. Be, yeah, really yeah. Just, fun. Especially for YouTube as well, because it will probably go horribly wrong. And I'm in exactly the same boat as you, which is I do not do woodwork well. Oh, my, my woodworking escapades <laughs> are absolutely shocking. But what is, it's funny what you say about Langstroth, though, because I'm in the same boat as you in that tried pretty much every single hive that's out there. And I love working the Langstroth. It's, yeah. it's a bit weird at the beginning, isn't it, with the little lugs, and you think, oh, I don't like these lugs. But then I remember on a 14 by 12 box once, I, I just, I, I didn't put it down on the floor, but I definitely didn't chuck it down on the floor. Maybe put no. it down a bit rough, and I broke like 80% of the lugs. Oh, just because right. they were really okay. heavy boxes, and it was full of honey. Right. And then it's, it, when you start breaking, snapping lugs on the National, then you realise on the Langstroth, it's just impossible to snap yeah. the lugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah box construction so easy and the, I, I like the top b space there's nothing i don't really like about langstroth and then people say well why don't you move to langstroth then and i say well because the everyone's on national nukes and then if you want i, I use the nuke production as part of my swarm management so yeah then to, if, if if everyone in the uk just said right we'll all go to langstroth tomorrow then i'd be well up for that but I, whilst yeah. everyone else is still on nationals we were a little bit stuck i think we are selling the nukes so there's a couple oh, of questions yeah. just coming on the chat that i will go to okay. first thing i would say though i always forget to say this if you are enjoying the stream please do give it a thumbs up it helps out on the algorithm so please give it a thumbs up so there were two questions that were very similar uh mm -hmm. and one of them answers the other one so it says for stuart when did you become a full-time beekeeper and what did you do before yeah um i'd have to look at my um my photographs again to try and work out um, around uh, 2013 or thereabouts. Uh, and the only reason I say that is because prior to that, 2008 on, uh, yeah, around 2008. So I, I went back to school. I, I completed a full time science degree uh, at our local university. The toughest four years of studying. Uh, of my life, which is why I'm not doing any BBKA modules because I've had enough of studying. Um, so uh, yeah, that was a science um, degree in biology and ecology. Oh, wow. So uh, immediately after that, uh, I joined the National Bee Unit as a bee inspector. So I had a, a short stint with the uh, bee inspectorate. And if anybody's out there, who has some experience in beekeeping and would like to just experience uh, a lot more variety. Honestly, seasonal bee inspectors jobs are just such good fun. Certainly when I was doing it, you get to meet so many different people, see again, so many different types of hive, so many different types of bees and eat lots of cake. Now, you know, the, the cake is always you know, an important part of the, the job. But yeah, that was a, that was a really enjoyable um, experience and taught me an awful lot. And I think it was the seasonal bee inspector's job that really pushed me through into the full-time bee farming. I spent an awful lot of time uh, looking for disease, finding disease, and then helping beekeepers clear it up. So cleaning their equipment, uh, scorching boxes and all of that kind of stuff. And I just got to thinking, well, actually, uh, you know, I'm not doing my own beekeeping here. I'm helping everybody else clean their boxes. And I've got a pile of boxes back home that I need to sort out. So as a seasonal bee inspector, you would go out in lovely weather conditions, help other people inspect their bees. And the only time you could inspect your bees was in the evening or when it was pouring with rain. And nobody, no sensible beekeeper wanted their hives open. So um, that, that was, uh, yeah, it was a really enjoyable part of the, the learning process, really. But I've been keeping bees since around 1989, on and off. I did actually find, I don't know if, I, I did have a photograph kicking around. Uh, I've got the camera kind of 
honed in on me because the rest of the office is an absolute tip, to be honest. Um, I had a photograph. Excuse me while I just lean across. I don't know if I can find it. Um, just very quickly. No, it's gone. It's in amongst all the all the rubbish. Um, one of my first swarms that um, popped up on on a hive um, outside the shed that I was talking about earlier. Um, my first experience with um, with swarms. Uh, we were in uh, a, a terrace house, and uh, the bee swarmed into a flowering cherry just a couple of doors down from us. And uh, I convinced the neighbour that it was okay, and I could climb up some ladders and and get these bees off. And I'd got an old boiler suit with. Uh, I guess it was, I think it used to be called a bee farmer veil, which was literally just the wires and a bit of mesh that you tucked into your bee suit. Wellington boots and climbed this ladder with a cardboard box to shake the bees into. And of course, when you first start beekeeping, you don't realise how heavy bees actually are when they're in a swarm. It's quite a weight that's clustered on this uh, this tree. So I shook the bees the weight of the box toppled forward. I spilt the bees down my front, all over my boiler suit, into my Wellingtons, climbed down, basically telling everybody that that was how you did it. It's fine. This is, this is how we keep bees and how we collect swarms. Turned the box upside down on a, a sheet, wedged the corner open, and prayed that the queen was in there. And all of these bees just fell off my uh, boiler suit onto the floor and ran into the box. It was it was an absolute miracle that it happened. But isn't this, it was, before, this was before YouTube, wasn't it? Because that sounds like yeah, a you're making absolutely. But uh, when when those bees run into a box, it's a wonderful thing to see. Or when you run them up into a hive, it's just such a fabulous thing to to see. Um, yeah, sorry. One of the things that I am notorious for is going off down rabbit holes and off piste when we talk so um I i'm sorry for that it's it's very welcome i, I enjoy it um and and you mentioned part of the next question as well which is uh, i love a random question like this so do you wear your bisu inside or outside of your wellington boots and then also what boots do you like to wear yeah so um bees have a tendency to climb upwards so uh, uh you will soon realize that if you wear your bee suit over your wellies eventually there's a tiny little gap and a bee will get in there and you feel something crawling up your leg and that's never a good sign um so bee suit inside my wellies normally it's it's wellington boots just standard wellington boots um uh, with a steel toe cap um, because if you drop a box on your foot it's going to do quite a lot of damage and that's a throwback to the be inspector days um health and safety of course is everything uh, and uh, sometimes i'll switch to just uh, a pair of hiking boots with a fairly high ankle uh, but being tall and you're quite tall as well aren't you lawrence um if you wear a bee suit with ankle boots eventually when you're bearing, uh, carrying things around the suit tends to ride up and expose your ankles and lower leg and the bees always seem to find that particular point to, to sting. So, yeah, I, I generally tend to default to Wellington boots. Yeah, I tried it a couple of times with, with a, a variety of other footwear that isn't wellies, and it, I get stung every time. It's, it's some, a lot of people yeah. wear rigger boots. I've seen them wearing rigger boots. Yeah, I just, yeah, rigger boots. I tried them and just got, just got battered. It's probably just my bees. Um, <laughs> Next question on here. I'm, I'm just going to go start going through the chat ones now because I've, I've answered uh, all of the ones on my list. So I'm going to work. Okay. I'll just go randomly. So question from Staunton Park B says, where do you sell most of your honey? So do you sell it bulk or in shops or where does it go? Yeah, a bit of, bit of both, really. Um, we don't have many local stockists, um, but the stockists we have sell lots. And uh, we tend to... Um, put some honey in barrels. Um, last year was our, our first um, journey into barreled honey and it went really well. So we'll continue doing that. And uh, we do sell some bulk in buckets to other beekeepers sometimes when it's 
when we we've had a fairly slow season and there's not quite so much I, I don't know about you Lawrence last year seemed to be a very good year for most people in terms of honey production so um it, it is a is a case of sometimes they want it sometimes they don't um but I always try to hold back around six months or so so that the stockists we have one of the important things with stockists is you never want to let them down so if you've if you've found someone locally the local shop that will sell your honey always hold some honey back for them because you don't want to have a phone call from them asking for more honey and find that you've run out and you're waiting for your spring crop to come in so if you can hold on to some honey through to the next crop that's coming in and beyond then you're you're always going to have some honey for those um, people that are, are supporting you and, and committed to selling your honey. Um, so yeah, at the moment, I guess we're kind of sixty percent wholesale, forty percent uh, retail stockist type situation. And have you found like there's been a dip in honey sales? recently because i think the general trend that, that we're seeing is it is getting more difficult to sell honey both on we, we don't sell wholesale but we, we buy wholesale but okay. it's getting a bit more difficult to sell honey i think in the market at the moment um have we seen a dip i i guess maybe a little um we've had some fairly hefty price increases haven't we so um you know the cost of fuel funnily enough i was looking at our fuel costs just this week um our financial year runs from the 1st of september we've spent nearly two and a half thousand pounds on diesel since the 1st of september and it's just bonkers how the costs have gone through the roof so um people seem to think non-beekeepers seem to think that the bees do all the work but you know the beekeeper puts an awful lot of effort in and it is quite expensive to to get round everywhere so yeah. it's um yeah it is a, a tricky situation um our sales are fairly buoyant at the moment i'd have to say um we've we've just put a couple of fairly big orders out so yeah it's it's um it's not bad it's not bad i'm not going to complain to... lawrence no no i know it's one of the things that i learned is to never complain about a heavy a heavy box of honey um what i was going to say was it i mentioned the cost of jars and lids that's good that's yeah incredible. yeah uh -huh. absolutely yeah. yeah we could we could sit here for the rest of the evening talking about price rises on everything yeah. i'll uh we'll, we'll try not to moan i think there's a good question here that i know i know you'll answer very well so it's from hillbilly says it's going to be his first season this year if and when he has to split his hive what would you say the easiest way to do this is for a new beekeeper okay um yeah hello uh good evening thanks for joining us um it's a great question um because it's one that pops up every single season uh, and beginner beekeepers um approach that initial split with um such trepidation but actually it's a really simple thing to do so i would um suggest an artificial swarm as your first and basic method um, it's a really simple process. Uh, wait until you've got some queen cells, uh, and I'm kind of oversimplifying it here, um, but wait until you have queen cells, then do the split. In the spring, our honeybees are just designed to produce the very best swarm cells. You'll get some fabulous queen cells produced in the spring. And what do most of us do? We cut them out, either throw them away or take photos and post them on Instagram or whatever else we do with them. If you can save uh, a really nice looking queen cell, uh, and of course the follow-up question to that is, what's a really nice queen cell look like? Um, so I would look for something that's uh, a fairly symmetrical queen cell. It doesn't really matter where it is on the frame. Um, if your colony has a tendency to produce lots of queen cells, then you may be um, just reproducing a swarmy colony. So you have to bear in mind some of the things that are going on within that colony. Uh, and to give you an example of that, I would tend not to artificially swarm a colony that's producing, throwing up, let's say, eight or more, 12 or more, 
queen cells, they tend to be a little bit on the swarmy side. Having said that, if you've only got one colony, then you've only got that one colony to work with. So uh, the worst case scenario that we've had is a colony threw up 58 queen cells, and I managed to find 57, and they still swarmed. So, you know, you, you just keep going and, and learn by these things. Um, so pick a very nice, plump, symmetrical queen cell, and you'll see them, uh, the really good ones have kind of got a dimple effect to them, and, and a pitted kind of dimply effect. They're really good queen cells to, to go for. And I would suggest that you only select one. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that advocate selecting two in case one fails, but you've always got the fallback of your original queen. So if that one queen cell fails, you can always combine them again and start the whole process again. So having two queen cells, you do run the risk of losing a swarm from that colony. So I, I would advocate just one queen cell. Uh, so found queen cells the important thing to do is to try to find the queen if you can find your queen it makes the process so much easier so uh, the way i kind of describe this whole swarming scenario and again we could be here all evening with this um, but if you think of your colony in three parts you have your queen your flying bees and your brood if you separate one of those from the rest then they're not likely to swarm. So in this instance, in an artificial swarm, what we're doing is we're separating the brood from the queen and the flying bees. And the way that we do that is we move the original hive away from its original position and we place a new hive in that original position. We put the queen into that box on a frame, ideally with emerging brood. So there's no eggs or very young larvae in there, but just bees that are emerging. That will give the queen somewhere to lay her eggs in and continue to lay. But all of the flying bees will go back to that position. So the queen will gather in all of the flying bees. You then take each frame in turn from the original hive, which I mean, you can move it six feet away, eight feet away. It doesn't really matter. Um, move it slightly to one side, it could be three feet away, but turn the entrance so the entrance is pointing in a different direction. And then go through each of those frames and find one of those queen cells that you really like the look of. Once you've got that, pop it in the middle of the brood box and take down all of the other uh, queen cells. And you need to shake all the bees off to, to knock those down to make sure you get every single last queen cell. And then you just close them up and let them do what comes natural. The new queen will emerge. Hopefully she'll go off, mate, come back successfully mated. And within three to four weeks, you should have a nice brood pattern back in, in that box. And it's just a fantastic way to start that journey in, in, your, um, in your beekeeping and learn some of the basics of what's happening within the colony as well. So that's, uh, that's what I would suggest to... Uh, um, did you say hill hillbilly yeah. hillbilly sorry hillbilly oh. um, well, well, yeah a great detailed explanation I love it you, you go into so much detail and you leave no stone unturned and what, what I would fully agree with on that is that it's your first year why not learn as much as you possibly can like that you're learning all about the different steps and the different stages of lava and the different types of swarm cell and seeing the process and you've got virgins and mated queens and so it's a you're doing a necessary thing, you're making a split, but you're also just kind of gaining as much experience as you possibly can, which is really good. Yeah. Question above it is a simple question. When do you think the first swarms are going to be? <laughs> well, again, location is everything. Um, uh, over here in the uh, east of England, um, I would say we're looking at the weather warming up. I uh, haven't been into any colonies yet. We're we're still holding off, uh, even though we've got temperatures of around 15 or 16 degrees Celsius. So uh, we'll probably start getting into the hives the first week of April, which isn't that far away, let's face it. Uh, and I would suggest that most people will start losing swarms when they're visiting the BBKA Spring Convention. <laughs> 
that's my that's my bet <laughs> this year. So towards the end of April, uh, oh, nice. and I speak from personal experience. Um, I visited um, quite a number of years ago with my brother, uh, who had just started beekeeping. He'd got a few hives uh, at the bottom of a friend's garden, and he received a panicky phone call from a TV aerial guy who was fitting an aerial and his colonies had swarmed multiple times onto the chimney and onto the roof and this poor guy had been stung mm -hmm. uh, and we were many many miles away uh, enjoying ourselves at um, at the trade show at, at the time so yeah and it will be later for some people it will be potentially earlier for others um but i, I suspect towards the end mid mid to late april is is the likeliest depending on the weather of course it, if it suddenly turns cold then you know uh, we can uh, kick that date into touch for those of you that listen to my podcast you'll know my predictions on weather and, and the like are not very good at all so don't hold me to it <laughs> if you lose a swarm early can you, yeah can you just wait. do us a favor and just predict six months of really cold snowy weather then yeah then exactly yeah. Wrong, yeah well um, we last year we had a, a, a failed borage crop because it was so um, dry and the farmer chose the one position in his farm that he couldn't irrigate and right. this year he's put irrigation in and he's right. he's putting borage in a, another location so the bees are going to be fine but I'm predicting a very wet summer because we've got irrigation now and we won't need it. So yeah. um, hopefully I not. I, I think it is looking rather dry, isn't it? I, it certainly for East Anglia. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, unbelievably, we've got nine minutes of Stuart left. So we're going to cram as many questions in as possible. Again, if you're enjoying the video, please do give it a thumbs up. It does help. With the I'll album. try and keep it short, Lawrence. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Got to... Uh, a member Joe Murphy who asks lots and lots of questions and they're always Hi, brilliant Joe. questions and he asked me this question in one of my live streams and I don't think I answered it properly Joe so I'm going to give it to you because it is a really good question and okay. it's, quite, it's quite a difficult one so if you could get the government to do something for beekeepers what would it yeah. be so it could be like changing regulations banning pesticides pretend you're the prime minister for a day what are you going to do oh beekeepers? definitely grants to commercial bee farmers um I, I I think quite radically and and in all seriousness, I would license beekeepers. I would ask beekeepers to sign up to a licensing system, uh, particularly those beekeepers that sell bees uh, and sell queens. I think it's really important that we try and set some standards. That um, I would charge a small fee. And that could go into better education and better assistance to beekeepers. But I do think um, we're missing an opportunity, really. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, and it could be on a sliding scale. The more colonies you have, the more you pay. But it would be, um, I think, very, very useful to be able to help finance more education for beekeepers uh, and, and grants for bee farmers. <laughs> You answered that so quickly. I, it, I really wrecked my brain as to think what, what I would do. But yeah, I, I'd agree with all that. I think a licensing one, particularly, yeah, for Queens and Nukes would be would be very good because the the, um, the MBU will go around and they'll, they'll do inspections and then they'll give people DASH accreditation. But there's no real formal um, accreditation scheme, is there, to say you've passed a certain level of husbandry or your bees have to be sold to a certain quality in terms of a temperament or number of friends of brood or conditions for postage like it just really simple standard things that respectable beekeepers may do but then a lot of other beekeepers may not do yeah so just to, uh, very quickly to add to that uh, as a seasonal bee inspector uh, i visited a uh, beekeeper who was selling nukes to beginner beekeepers and uh, he couldn't identify that he had european fowl brood and he'd sold, I can't remember the exact number, 20 or 30 plus nukes to beginner beekeepers all over the country with European fowl brood. Uh, fortunately, he kept good records and we were able to contact everybody uh, and they were all given uh, full refunds. But it just shows you that unless there is some standard, there are people out there through no fault of their own 
and yeah. they're trying to help they're trying to make themselves a little bit of spare money by selling some bees but they just don't have the experience to be able to do it uh, properly or safely and you can imagine as a beginner beekeeper how devastated you would be if i turned up and looked through your bees in your back garden and said i'm sorry we're going to have to destroy them uh, it's 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 heartbreaking it's absolutely heartbreaking and i do feel for any beginner beekeeper that's um, lost bees over winter because i do i do understand how it feels Sorry, I'm waffling. Let's go on to the next question, Lawrence, quickly. I'm, I'm just going to split the question on this one. Um, so I, I'll just, what, what do you use for your varroa treatments? Do you have like a management process or what chemicals? Yeah, uh, so we, up, up until now, we've um, used treatments in the autumn and then an oxalic acid treatment over winter. And are, they, are your bees coping well? What, what, what treatment do you use in the autumn? Uh, so we vary it. We, we try to use different... Um, treatments um, this year it was apistan so we won't use apistan again for uh, at least four or five years um, we'll switch to one of the amatraz products probably this year if we're going to use them but i spoke to uh, you you've got me waffling again lawrence we um i spoke to a bee farmer locally who has kept bees for 50 or 60 years and he only ever treats with oxalic acid over the winter, and he uses no other forms of treatments, and that works great for him. So as a treatment, we're going to yeah, we're going to use that as a uh, as a treatment this year on some apiaries and see how how we get on. Good stuff. Right, next question. Then we're cramming them in. A question from Jan Swanwick, who you may know. So, a question for Stuart: Have you have you consolidated your premises yet? No, it's a bit of a nightmare, but we're close. We we may have a solution. Um, uh, so watch this space. But yeah, hi Jan, good to to see you here this evening. So I'm I'm really sorry to everyone who answered questions there, and we haven't been able to get round to answering them all. I just thought I'd give you the last couple of minutes while you're here, Stuart, to to say anything or invite people to your Patreon or your YouTube page or anything like that, and give you the opportunity just to have the last few words. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, you know, a lot of you will know um, that we have our videos on YouTube and um, some of you will know that we have a subscription site on Patreon where we uh, have published through the active season something like three, sometimes four videos a week. We've got the podcast there. Uh, if you put it in beekeeping terms, you know, if you sign up to our uh, coaching tier, it will cost you a lot less than a nuke will cost you this year, and it might just save you that nuke going through the summer and into the winter. Um, we have one-to-one -one mentoring, uh, Zoom regular monthly Zoom meetings there. Um, but we can also give access to just the videos and uh, podcasts. And to put it into perspective, we, we almost have 1,200 individual pieces of content on our patreon page now so there's an awful lot of back catalog with all of the various topics that you could possibly want and we're adding to that all the time so and it would be um it'd be lovely to to see you guys there and to be able to offer you some help and support through your beekeeping season um but before we go yeah just i'd just like to wish everybody a fantastic season I th i'm really excited about where we're heading I think spring is just around the corner for, for our bees and then it will be all hands to the pumps. So I do hope that you all have an enjoyable season. And um, if we don't catch up on Patreon, then uh, do look out for some more videos on YouTube this year. We, we are definitely going to uh, publish more videos on YouTube. Um, and thank you, Lawrence, for the invitation. It's It's been really nice to catch up and to, to chat with people. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Stuart, for coming on. Uh, you are an inspiration to a lot of people, as, as you probably already know. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on and, and sharing your information you. and advice. And I will I'll close down the stream there and uh, maybe we can do it again sometime. Good night, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye.